So part of um, part of virtual bird fair, we're going to do some um, content over the the next few days, just just to to keep the spirit of bird fair alive. I mean, it's such a social event, and all the the, uh, the lectures and the hands on. But you know, it, it's just unfortunate that we can't be together. And uh, but what we, we are doing is trying to put some uh, content together to. Um, Keep, keep the bird fair spirit alive and, and today we've got uh, Mr Paul Hackett who is our um, one of our brand ambassadors a digiscoping legend who I'm sure if you've visited bird fair <laughs> you will of course seen and heard Paul Hackett because he's very active at the show doing lectures and uh, talks and uh, demoing the kit so I'm sure he's a, a familiar face so good morning Paul Good morning, Mr. Rob Wilson. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Very, very, very sad that we can't be together. Normally, we would be, uh, well, we would be we, I guess we would have prepared all the talks and everything. We would have met up. And we'd be working on the booth. We'd be having a beer in the evening, planning and discussing talking, with talking everything colleagues. optics and digitizing yeah. and yeah. damned and, and talks yeah. and uh, raffles and talking and selling and enjoying and yeah, yeah. Seeing, and seeing all the, our uh, international friends and colleagues exactly. from abroad of my 20th bird fair now 20 bird fair and i think for all those years i've talked to everyone yeah for my yeah. sins i'm trying to think when i first uh, met you I, I remember we we met at bempton cliffs and um i was there to photograph you the yeah so it, it at that point, I, I was doing a bit of digiscoping, but just just not not heavily. And I, I wasn't even using Koa Kit at that point. Um, and then I met you, and um, we met in the car park. And within about eight seconds, your scope had set up, and you were pho uh, photographing. I think it was tree sparrows in the car park. And uh, yeah, we've just been friends. You never ever get away from that car park. It's uh, yeah, friends ever since, and I've learned a lot from you. And obviously, you know you're your digiscoping kit and technique sort of inspired me and uh, got me going and um yeah you know it's uh, it's great so we're going to run off a few quick fire questions here for you just to uh, get a feel for your digiscoping okay let's go okay so first question is just just for everyone where are you based and have you got a local patch for digiscoping yeah, I'm based in Hertfordshire in a little sleepy hollow village called Thunderidge. Um, I've got Anwell Nature Reserve near me. Um, I've also got Kingsmead. Both have water, which means there's lots of opportunities for more birds, really. But yeah, I've got some of my local places. Quite enjoy it. I was there the other day, actually, to get a Temming stint. And I actually digiscoped it with the expander. With So with the two times lens, it's something like 200 mag two and a half thousand millimeter yeah, amazing. and still got a still off it yeah still using it still doing it all these years on i've been to rye meads with you i remember uh staying over at your house right down to rye meads it's, they've got hides there haven't they and things and a bit of like wetland yeah kingfish got a brand new kingfish hide and nobody's seen yet we shot a little promotional video i remember remember it well yeah yeah uh, <laughs> we've done some, we've done a few. some work together over the years haven't we um how long have you been digiscoping? I mean, you are one of these sort of uh, pioneers, and I mean, you've been in yeah. it since pretty well day one, haven't you? You could say I'm one of the forefathers, more like the four grandfathers, to be honest, at my age, at the youngest age of 60, approaching 61. Um, 1998, Rob, is my earliest memory, and with the kit that I had then, uh, Jeff Bowton will love this. It was a Leica Apo Telebid 77 mil with a 2060 zoom and i had a sony camcorder high eight millimeter i then progressed to using the 20 wide angle lens and the sony handycam which was a 10 times optical um so i was taking one megapixel stills with that that's probably one of my earliest recollections what first alerted you to digiscoping did you see did you uh, how did how did you get to find out about the method was it did you see something uh bird fair or did you just see something on the internet no I, like a few of us at the time i did i discovered it myself right um obviously lawrence poe malaysia everybody knows about lawrence poe poh sadly no longer with us but 
called the the grandfather of digiscoping. I didn't find out about him till years later. Um, he just basically put a digital camera to a scope, and that's how it was born. But I did it with a camcorder, and then tried to get stills as I was watching the camcorders improving. At that time, the Sony Handycam was brilliant because it had a stills function, a button from video record to stills, and I just, what well, I say, one megapixel pictures. And obviously twitching at the time, and I was getting these big images because at the time it was um, you were getting a picture off, you know, off slide, and the photograph was six before and a tiny little speck of a rare bird. I was producing these big images, although soft. There was a lot more detail in it. People liked them. I actually had my own uh, website within Surfbirds. I used to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> six before photos. This is a oh god, you're making me think back now. You really are. So your Sony Handycam, you, you've, you, you've actually still got that camera. It's camcorder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and, and then and to, I know that you sort of hang on to many of your cameras. Uh, so just get, get, see if you can give us a quick run through of what you've had over the years. I think I had the 4500, the cool picks, Nikon, and then I moved on to um, the little contacts and the Yashikas. I've got most of the I've got most of the original Coolpix range from the eight eighties, and some of these will only take like something like a a sixty four megabyte compact flash card. They won't take any more. Um, I've still got them, still working order. Um, the um, obviously the Coolpix range, and obviously the famous forty five hundred. Um, also, um, we got. The Samsungs, there was the Samsung MV3s and, and such like, they was good. Um, also, the famous one for me was the Contact Shoe 4R because it was 4 megapixel, or 8 megapixel, I can't remember, the twist body, um, you know, the mix, mixed everything. Um, and it was, um, you could take pictures and it just literally, it would record, it was non-stop, there was no buffer. And this was unusual. Um, and then I moved up to probably what's probably the best compact cameras that's probably ever been was the um, Sony's, the RX100s, and they made four ver five versions of them, I think we're on now. That's probably one of the best ones I've ever had. In the Yashica cameras, they had a tiny little um, filter thread on the front, didn't they? And you could get the little plastic adapter. The contact, yeah. Contact, yeah. yeah. They used to Incredible snap. size. They used to snap so right small. Right could you talk us through your, your current setup? Well, I've got two set setups, uh, Rob. Basically, I've got the, uh, the trusted 884 scope with my current Go, Go camera, Go to camera is my Panasonic G9. Um, on it, I have got the body, the 20 millimeter f1.7 pancake lens. The step up, step up rendering adapter, which connects us to our DA10, and then the sleeve, which when you take off the um, the eye, the eyes, the eye cup off the off the, off the uh, eyepiece, you put the inner inner sleeve in, and it just slips over and taps up like that. So that's my current current kit. Um, I do like to use a remote, especially here in the UK, where we haven't got the Florida sun or the Barcelona sun, as I call it. So yeah, my current thing is, so this will cover me for stills and also 4K video and for slow-mo. Yeah. That's my kit. Um, decent tripod, video head, as per norm. Um, obviously, you need plenty of these, the batteries. Yeah. They out. And I do like using this 1.6 extender that we have. I do enjoy using this. It's pretty smart. And I used it this week. But it's my local Temming stint that had decided to grace one of our little nature reserves near to me. So I do like using that. That's, that's my normal rig. Um, I've also got a very long balance plate on it um, to obviously take the weight um, of the scope and the camera. Um, and my other thing is, is that I use the phone. And yeah. this would be my another DA10 adapter going on to one of Cower's customised um, adapters. So that's my, so I've got the same kind of uh, attachment. So I put my phone in and it covers it on that. Um, things to remember is don't forget, always have a battery pack. Yeah. And obviously the iPhones, you need the um, <clears throat> headphones, you can take the shot. 
or even a dongle this one from foam scope which i like to use so that's my that's my current got my current kit it i've is. also got a hood loop as well when it's bright weather i just put it on it and it takes the shade out of it protects it from the glare i like to use that as well. which do you enjoy the most because obviously the the trends we're seeing is that people are moving towards the smartphones but as a as a purist and somebody that's been in the game for so long and such a you know perfectionist which which sort of gives you the most joy and the the best consistent results do you find it with the the, the dslr body the the micro four thirds system you use all the smartphone i like both i don't really have a, a, a choice i mean i will use the phone um when when situations arise where distant stuff is required and if nobody realizes this if you've got a, an iphone or similar or a, a, a smartphone with two lenses um this is the future quickly i'll just rant on about this the two times lens has actually changed phone scoping whereas if in the previous all mobile phones from time memorial was a wide angle lens so most people put it on and you had the vignette in so you are most people would actually stretch it actually which means you're just cropping it and pixelating it no good so eventually convincing people to use the muscle of the power of the optics which is your zooms zoom eyepiece and then you know going up to maybe 40 45 and it's clearing around there with the advent of this two times lens now and this is a revelation i've been piping on about for the last two years at bird fair is the fact that if you've got a wide angle zoom eyepiece as soon as you put it on at on the two times without any actual zoom on the eyepiece the vignetting's free so um I've made a video a year or two back with your good self. We put that thing shot entirely on the iPhone. And I think some people were a bit skeptical to there, a couple of trolls on the old internet. You just don't let them get to you. You just literally keep uh, doing what you do. And uh, I'm, we've produced that amazing video where I've just handheld it in the hides. I spent God knows how many days i did two supple sundays and i was up at the crack of dawn getting there up to lake and heath in, in suffolk um for four o'clock and then dashing back at 10 to 8 to the car park and then hours drive to get into work for nine o'clock i think i put seven seven days in there so five mornings and two full sundays to produce a two and a half minute three minute video but so worth it would you not agree that video absolutely, yeah. I mean, absolutely high fact you can use iphone yeah. so in answer to your question um I like both. There's obviously more detail um, with the with the Micro Four Thirds camera. The stickler is, and, and more better control on metering, of course. Uh, but people, a lot of people don't even realise about the phone scoping as well. You know, you can meter, you can expose with the right app, etc. Uh, so yeah, you can work things. So no, I like both, Rob. I, 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 I like yeah. both. It's the it's a good question, but I, I like both. I mean, I'm still I'm still passionate about what I do now, 20 odd years on. I, I I still love this hobby. I still enjoy teaching it, and I love the joy when somebody's taking a picture for the first time. It's it's a joy to behold. One of my first talks I've ever did at Bird Fair was an old gentleman. I showed some from the audience, and I basically did an A to Z of how to digiscope in about 20 minutes, which is no mean feat at Bird Fair because they're up there at the back with the boards, and you three minutes, two minutes, one minute, off you go. And I managed to get this old gentleman focusing and we had it connected to the screen and everything and people could see what he was doing. And he was delighted that we had a bird feeder outside and we took a picture of some birds that I managed to ask the people, good people at, at, at uh, Rutland to put the bird feeder out. So we had actual material there and he used joy on his face when we showed him back. So yeah, I, I get a buzz out of helping people with this. Clearly I do. You, you've known me long enough. It's a great hobby. It's a leveller, and it's not just birds as well. Insects, yeah. um, landscapes. I mean, I love sunsets. I mean, I recently did a a video, and I did a sunset at God knows what time in the morning. I think it was about quarter to five, five o'clock in the morning, over in Anglesey, and I got a rising sun with a little bit of sea below it, and uh, we had we had um, seabirds flying along it. It was just majestic. And um, it was blowing a hooli as well, so yeah, probably one of yeah. I, you can sh you can shoot anything with it, insects, macro. You don't realise how good it is. It's just down to the minimum focusing distance on the on the eight eight four scope or eight eight three scope. It's yeah, down to that. 
that's, that's what I like. That, I'm, I'm getting more into the video side of things because I think you can just tell such a story, can't you? You can go out for the day and, and plan a yeah. little story that you want to tell and shoot your footage. Yeah. And, I don't know, it just pushes you and um, I really enjoy that. So uh, would you say that you're a stills guy at heart or uh, because I know that you're shooting more and more video? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a stills guy at heart. But the video, once you've made a video, a small short video, because nobody's doing feature length stuff now with the attention span we've got now in the modern world, two or three minutes is good, but people have no idea the work and effort put in to make a two minute, three minute video. Just the recording, as I've explained to you about the bitten, and then, you know, the editing, it takes so, so long, but it can be justified. Um, there's, um, there's a couple of clips that you're going to show of um, a llama guy. I got the amazing opportunity to go to the Buso project in the Spanish Pyrenees uh, a year or two back and I've got some slow-mo video of, of an adult Lama Gaia and uh, I hope people will enjoy it. It's just a couple of clips. I'm really getting into slow-mo even though the quality is a little downgraded from the 4K. It's never 4K in slow-mo. 1080 I think, something like that, is that the human eye can take so much more in when you see something in slow motion. You can appreciate it you take it in as opposed to a video with two or three seconds and it's gone. Yeah. Great experience. But to see something in slow-mo go past you. And as I say, with these couple of clips of the Lama Gaia, it kind of, and remember this is manual focus as well. So it was slight blurred happening. It's me trying to catch up with my eye, but some parts of it are super sharp and I'm ever so proud of these clips. Um, I've been invited to go back again, uh, but slow-mo for me now is something I'm really getting into. I just make films of slow-mo, to be honest, because you just see the colour, you see the action, you can appreciate things more, you spot things as well in slow motion uh, yeah, that you yeah, don't yeah. see, and I'm really, really into that. So as I say, hopefully people understand it when they see this clip of the, the Lama guys from the Boost Up project up there in the Pyrenees in Spain. Really good. Um... That leads nicely on to the next question. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is the most exotic location that you've um, been to to do, do your digiscoping? Um, exotic would have to be the Cape Verde Islands to see the red-billed tropic bird. I kind of walked into a tourist place in, in, the, in the town I was trying to... Um, we were staying in, and... Um, I just walked into this shop and it was like um, canoes, uh, windsurfing, go and see the small lemp and sharks and, and bird watching. And I just spoke to this guy and he happened to be a Welshman, great guy. And he was, he went to university with Chris Packham. He was a very interesting bloke. And he said, oh, I'll just make a call. And quickly he made a call and next thing you know, right, tomorrow morning, be back here. And so I went up there. And I just had, they sat me down for an hour and I was on a cliff face and I was just literally had red-billed tropic birds. And the problem with the red-billed tropic bird is, as you see from the picture, the tail is so long, the tail feathers, plus the bird. So to digiscope them, so difficult, so, so difficult to get everything in. But yeah, that's probably the most exotic place. The red-billed tropic bird, I mean, I remember you showed me the image of it in flight and actually I think you you're one of the very few digiscopers that does photograph birds in flight. That's one, I mean, very often people, that, that, um, when you're talking about digiscoping, you know, you'll say, well, it's all right for perch birds or static long range subjects and things, but with some skill and technique and practice, it, 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 I remember the first time I met you at Bempton, you were photographing the, the gannets flying in. And, yeah. uh, it, so it is possible. It is possible. The, um... There's still quite a few people that won't have a go. It's probably my biggest thing I try and, wrong word to use, cajole or push. But a bird on a stick, digiscoping can be so much more. Um, and that's reflected in some of the pictures. Um, there's, a, there's a few of us are doing it. There's my good self, uh, my good friend, Justin Carr. He's a very, very good taker of images in flight. Um, there, are, there are a few more of the people but it's something that needs to be tech. You need to learn it. And obviously we'll never show the hundreds and thousands of pictures we deleted. <laughs> I mean, I've got the, the red bill traffic bill comes to mind, but the puffing shot, I mean, that was a couple of hours on the farms and God knows how many 
hundreds of pictures I deleted and I wasn't having a fixed point and, and allowing the birds to come through the fixed point. Um, I actually tracked it and then doing it in very, very short burst modes. Um, well, yeah, that's a while back and also the red kite shot as well where it's swooping down. That's quite a surreal place. It's a transport cap up in Oxfordshire off the M40 and the people feed the kites with the bacon and the sausage, the meat. So the, but the, but the, it's, a, it's a lorry stop. So there's some bemused um, uh, lorry driver with his sandals and white socks in the background. If I could just pan back, you would have seen what I saw. Um, yeah, it's a surreal time. It's, just, it's amazing what's in the background when people don't realize they see the picture, but yeah, quite a, quite a good place that was. Yeah, but I do like flight shots, Rob. I mean, always trying it, but the trouble is you just need good light otherwise you know you're putting up stupid iso um etc um obviously with the advent of the the new software from topaz which i might be looking into for getting rid of noise it's yeah. always a it's always a thing to look into but yeah love flight shots i love action shots and i, I really would encourage anybody watching this is is just get that iso speed up high on a nice sunny day depending on on the um the conditions Obviously, you might need to plus expose with a bird in the sky, centre metering or spot metering, whatever your choice is, and just track it, follow it. I, I can't ask, can't say more enough about it, really. It's for people just to try and push the boundary. It's not a boundary so much because digiscoping, when I've got these people who are purists in cameras, oh, it's, digiscope is not really photography. Well, we've kind of proven that now. It's a bit stereotypical and it's gone now. It's outdated. I suppose with the uh, the 4K video now and things and the image grabs that doing those action shots, you can just let the camera film and um, then go through and pick out some of the highlights, of the, 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 which is something else you've done. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with Panasonic cameras, which is good now, we had the 4K um, uh, photographic mode. Where, where do you see Digiscoping heading? Do you think that um, the smartphones will just completely take over as the technology? improves and the apps improve you know the integrated identification and the sharing of images and do, do you think that the days are numbered on um the dslr style um they're numbered anyway because there's never been a great number of people with you imagine you've got to think of what happened you first had the comp you had the compact camera yeah. and then we had the smartphone and then we had micro four thirds and then people obviously using DSLR. Um, we're already there, to be honest. Um, you see far more people doing phone scoping uh, than you do DSLR in. So it's quite a niche thing. It's it's, it's it's a small thing, but the detail you got you're going to, you're going to get far more detail out of a micro four thirds or DSLR or full frame camera than you are going to be a phone. But if people's level of perception of what they are happy with, then far be it for me to actually go off on a tangent about being a purist etc uh, but yes it's, it's been happening over the years and most of them, i mean all the talks i've been giving if you look in the last 10 years with kawa how many phone scoping talks have i given in the last 10 years it says it all really and obviously uh, inquiries on the booth on the stand at bird fair and any other any other fairs that we've done it's it's predominantly phone scoping because yeah. let's face it most people have a phone that's right it's simple but but to me it's there, it's both. I mean, people are in awe of the great pictures, but somebody needs to get a great picture out of a phone, that's a skill set as well, because you've got to know the scope, its limitations, its minimum or ma minimum focus, if it's something small and close, uh, focusing, and then the, the phone itself, making sure that it's not wobbly with the adapter, that it's buckled down, and then using the settings that's in the app on the phone. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. It's been, it's been happening for a couple of years and it will continue to do so. You know, the, the, you can see the trends, can't you? Like, say, at Bird Fair and things, the inquiries and the, the most popular talks are always smartphone and it, it makes sense, doesn't it? So it's it's easy, it's fun and, and um, you know, it's uh, the, the technology is only going to improve as well. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, phones in two or three years' time, the new iPhone out this year, What's that going to be like camera wise? <laughs> you know, we've had that two times lens, wide angle and super wide angle. That was the biggie for last year. 
on the iPhone series, the 11, 11 Pro. What's the new one going to be like? It's going to be a 12, presumably, when it all comes out. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. As long as your equipment does what, the, what you're happy with, that's the main thing. Yeah, I mean, I've never been one for chasing um, trends. I've always tried and tested stuff myself and made my own opinion. And that's what people value, I think, me for is my honest, realistic approach to it. And there's obviously some times when we've had people where, even at Bird Fair, and I've said to them, and it's my first major comment, is can you manually focus? There's no point trying to sell them a scope if they can't, because they're, they're all going to sell it, and then you've got a bad name. So for me, there's been a couple of times over the years where I've actually said, if you can't manually focus, but it's also, <laughs> the biggest thing is, it comes up time and time again, this one, you'll laugh is when you get your eyes tested oh about 10 15 years ago so no wonder they can't focus they can't see off the back of the camera through the through the, through the viewfinder um you know the, the eyes testing the amount of people at birth where i've actually encouraged to go and get their eyes tested and the other bugbear is people who, who have their clrs and um microphone threads didn't realize about di the diopter oh i didn't know it was there i mean it's one of the first things i do when i'm teaching but yeah hey ho such is life well, do you Take, take us through a few of these, uh, some of your images that, uh, that you've sent us and uh, yeah, just give us a bit of background to, to, the, to the pictures. Okay, so the puffing one uh, in flight with the sand eels, yeah, I spent a couple of hours there, just a surreal, a surreal couple of, de a couple of hours. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of images deleted, uh, really enjoyed that. And I knew when I'd taken it, I'd got a good picture. I just knew I'd got it. So chuffed the bits for that one. Really enjoyed that one. The bitten picture, that's from uh, the bitten hide in Essex at uh, Fisher's Green, famous for the bittens. Uh, everybody had left the hide freezing, started to snow. All of a sudden, I noticed the, the bitten was really close up, whacked up the scope eyepiece to 60. I think that was taken something like on a, a 13th of a second, but the water droplets were actually snow and they melted. So that's why I love that picture. The red billed tropic bird picture, um, dream bird to see. Um, so lucky, so fortunate walking into that shop in the, in, the, in the village where we were staying and then taking out the next day with his scientists. I actually held a, a chick and, and but given they, they waited an hour for me just to take pictures and that was surreal. And, and at one point I had maybe eight, nine, 10, 11 birds in front of me swooping, flying around on the sea. That was surreal. Yeah, pretty good. The the rough, well, probably pictures like that. That's a male rough. That was over at RSPB Frampton. A friend of mine let me know that there was a few birds there. Once the females stay after a certain part of the month of the spring, they might not go, which means that some males will stay and wait, and then they went into their finery. So that's there. Otherwise, you have to go to Finland to see that. And this it was quite a dull day. The original picture is so dark. But yeah, to see a male rough just stood up, strutting his stuff, just amazing. Um, the redneck greed picture, young bird just coming into adult plumage and watching people. And that's what I do. I do watch a lot, and which means focusing and watching a bird for an hour or so where some people just, as you say, if, that, if their thing is just taking a bird on the stick, but you're never going to get the action pictures if you don't. So again, I like to promote action, but the only way to do that is to literally follow the bird. Um, yeah, so that's a couple of pictures my yellow wagtail picture that I love with uh, the foreground of the bales of hay straw. They were just literally defocused and then the flies buzzing around. I've gone a little bit arty in my, in my old age as opposed to big, big images that people are known for me in detail. But um, I think some of the pictures that people will see will give a fair representative of, of what I do. What about the, uh, the skewer? Because I mean, I love that shot. Oh man, oh man. What happened was um, over at uh, Teesside, there was reports of a pump skewer, pomerade skewer, uh, loafing around, hanging around. Big bird, big bully of a bird of the sea, powerful bird. And went, went there and all of a sudden the wind got up and everybody started, oh. Uh, so I literally got down on my belly in the wet sand, put my legs on my tripod flat and I'm on the same level as it. And this wind was whipping up. And I actually did a couple of photos of the bird uh, focus sharp and slightly forward of it, the sand, the sandstorm that blew up. And I've actually now with that bird, the head might be a little soft, but that was my intention. If you look at the actual picture, the sand is sharp. 
and it I can, kind of highlights the fact and on the level. Love that shot. Brilliant. Yeah, so, so, so the, the final question really is, uh, if people want to um, find you online and look at your work and get some inspiration, where are the best places? Um, I've got a couple of social media sites that I use and I'm, I'm quite active on, which is Facebook, obviously, uh, but mostly Instagram and Twitter on my Twitter feed. Uh, in the pro pros of uh, making my own website. So once that's up and running, I can obviously help and teach people. Um, that's probably my aim. So basically, I'm hoping to teach people basic digi scoping, uh, phone scoping, and video scoping. That's probably the three areas people want to learn about. So yeah, and so yeah, and with obviously with the current COVID uh, climate, um, Zoom webinars are obviously quite popular, and um, you know, and it's a way to teach people. So I can still teach people from the comfort of my home, really. It's really good. You know, it's interesting to say that some of these pictures that you do digiscope with, we use them in marketing materials. You know, that just shows what the quality is like. So, yeah, well, it's good around the world, doesn't it, really? Yeah. We're, in, we're in Japan. Some of the dealers actually like to see these videos and pictures. Yeah, it's, it is amazing. I've had a very fortunate digiscoping life, really. Um, it started off with um, Eagle Eye, who made the adapters, Carlo, Carlo Bonacci, great guy, did a couple of bird fairs there. And then I joined um, a consultant for Zeiss, and I was actually Zeiss, Carl Zeiss UK rep for the optics, UK and Northern Ireland. So I had a really good time with um, Zeiss in the UK and my mentor, Stephen Ingram, who I should mention, great guy, very helpful man. And then obviously my time with Cower. So it's, it's, I've been lucky. I have been so blessed. Um, met some great people, had some great experiences, traveled around the world to Digiscope. Um, just been so lucky, especially Spain. I've been so lucky, so, so lucky. And actually to get paid for your hobby, which is so, is unusual these days. Um, so that has helped, obviously, with the copious amounts of equipment I've spent money on over the years. God knows how much money I've spent on kit. Cameras, batteries, memory cards, cables, accessories, tripods, video heads. <laughs> Don't even want to go there. Lots and lots of money. But uh, I think a lot of people have benefited from the knowledge of my mistakes where I have a problem and I resolve it. I die, if, I, if somebody gives me a problem in digiscoping, I like to face it head on, deal, deal with it and go through the wall and fix it. Find a resolution. I really enjoy it. I'm still as mad and obsessive and passionate about it now as I was when I began. Um, I just think the quality of my stuff is obviously, in my eyes anyway, humbly, it's got a, a little bit better. Um, and I just like spreading the word. It's never going to go away from me. Um, I was thinking the other day, what's going to happen to all my, all my backups? Who do I give them to? What do I do? It's a mad thing because you imagine these terabytes and terabytes of stuff. <laughs> I might that. rationalize and cut it all down. But yeah, but I'm still enjoying it. It's a shame we haven't got a bird fair this year. I really, really so yeah. miss the camaraderie of seeing the cow people, all my colleagues, seeing my friends around the world, selling equipment, talks, our raffle, our famous raffles yeah. in the optics market, my, me doing my compare stuff, yeah, yeah. I enjoy that. Right. Yeah, I'm going to miss it, definitely. It's hard not to, uh, not to be there, but um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully next year we come back and... Uh... Yeah, we'll be fine, we'll be back next year, I'm sure we will. Well, thanks ever yeah. so much Paul, for... Um, Joining us this morning, giving us your time, we're, we're, we're very lucky to have you on, on on the team, you know, be able to show some of your amazing work and talent, so much appreciated, and like I say, we'll have to meet up for a pint as soon as we can, because, you know, we, we, we always bounce off each other with ideas, don't we, and stuff, and so... Uh, yeah. yeah, the dream team, the coward dream team, part of the coward dream team, don't forget John, don't forget Gunter and everybody else over in Germany, and Jeff. Rob, Simon, we've got a real people. Good yeah, we've got a great team. We have got an amazing team. So we'll hopefully, uh, hopefully see you soon, and uh, we'll get all right. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Cheers, Paul. Nice talking to you, Rob. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Right.